On to this now. Scientists have expressed a great discomfort at uh, low death rates despite rising new COVID-19 infections. They also point out that the varying rates of vaccination and uh, poor rollout of boosters is evidence of a rise in variants and uh, new surges of the pandemic. Joining us now to share their insight in how we can better protect ourselves, Stellenbosch University epidemiologist Dr. Joe Barnes and Virginia University's virologist Professor Barry Show. Good evening to you all. Thank you very much for your time and uh, joining us uh, tonight uh, here on In Focus. Uh, Dr. Barnes, let's start with you because Professor Show is is a resident here. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Tavo. Good evening. Good evening. And your listeners. <laughs> Dr. Barnes, does the high rate of cases matter now that COVID 19? is relatively mild overall in the majority that are testing. In other words, uh, uh, especially with the, the case to hospitalization ratio having widened so much. Good evening to you and good evening to our listeners. Um, getting COVID of any description and any variant or sub-variant always matters. It is, it's much, much more dangerous than the seasonal flu. And you have no way of predicting whether you may be ending up with all of these very debilitating sym symptoms called long COVID. And it doesn't only happen to people who have had COVID-19 uh, uh, very seriously. So it, it obviously, obviously matters a lot. And, it, and I'm very concerned about the, the sort of general Apathy. I understand people are in inverted commas tired of the pandemic and they just want to get on with their lives. But we will have to, in future, for quite a long time, learn to manage risks. Yeah, and Professor, we are not doing it at the moment. Professor Show, I mean, uh, Dr. Ban speaks of uh, uh, fatigue, but. In, in some instances, one particular, if you look at the, the narrative in the U.S., and maybe you can say to an extent here in South Africa as well, vaccines and antivirals have been equated with really the end of the pandemic for many. Yeah, good evening, Tavo. No, I, I, I think this is a big problem. I think Dr. Barnes articulated it very well. There is a sort of a growing apathy. I, I think even the way I surrender uh, you know, the, the point is that we can't at this stage capitulate uh, to, uh, to, you know, we, we're not there yet. Uh, the pandemic is still with us. As you say, certainly the hospital admissions are low, the mortality is low, but I think we can't be kind of deceived by that. Um, you know, this, this epidemic can go one of two ways. Hopefully, we hope that it, that it is a virus which is now becoming endemic in the human population, that we are starting now to kind of, in a way, kind of tolerate it in uh, quote, unquote. Um, and, but on the other hand, we, it is an unpredictable virus, and it really has surprised us in so many ways. And it could go the other way. When I say go the other way, we already have seen with Omicron, with these sub-variants of Omicron, how they kind of change genetically so, so readily. Uh, and, you know, if we look at the, at the past with Omicron, it's quite different to what we had uh, with the alpha, the beta, and the delta uh, up to now. Uh, you know, those viruses didn't change anywhere as quickly as Omicron does. And the way that it's changing now, particularly that it is escaping the immune response, that's a little bit of a worry. That's the one thing. And the other thing is that, you know, we could have new variants coming on board as well. I'm not, I don't want to kind of alarm people. I think... It's, it's, it's relatively unlikely. I think the more likely is that we do or we're on our way to becoming endemic. But I don't think that we must let our guard down. I think we must still look after the population. We still need to have some, some of those infection prevention measures still in place, yeah. particularly the masking and the physical distancing. I think those are really important. And most important of all is vaccination. As, as uh, Professor Sherb, Dr. Barnes says, I mean, it, it, it feels or seems like one of the things that we are betting on is that the future variants will be mild. Is, is that guaranteed and, and, and uh, how could that possibly backfire on us? But the other thing that we are betting on is, is that the vaccines being administered will be durable and effective even for future variants. Is that to me, Tova? That's uh, Dr. Barnes. Dr. Barnes. Oh, to me. <laughs> um, 
I don't think I teach a lot of students and talk to a lot of people, and I never plan on hope. We all hope, but we can't plan on hope. We, we can't live on it. It's not got evidence behind it. It's, it's an emotion. We need to plan on what we see in front of us. And we have no guarantees whatsoever that something with pink tackies on is not going to pop out from behind the, the next bush and, and catch us totally unprepared. So we, we have to plan on, on, on what we see in front of us. And it, this is one of the situations where the past history doesn't necessarily promise us that it will go on like that for the next year or five or ten. So we need, to, we need to help the population to realize that without their cooperation, we, we are not going to, to win this. And we, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We have, we've got vaccines in a, a remarkably short time. But there's a lot of work for that too, because if new things was being tackled on pitch up, we will need new vaccines to cope with that. So I'm really desperate that we can get some education campaigns and information campaigns going to tell people, don't drop the war midway through. Yeah. Professor Sher, I mean, speaking of that, the rolling out of vaccines in, in, in our conversations and in your experience, uh, Prof., uh, can we roll out future vaccines faster enough uh, uh, to, to be able to counter a possible epidemic surge should a new variant that escapes all the current ones uh, emerge? Yeah, totally. this is one of the big worries that we've, we've had as in, our, in our vaccine, Mac, and that is that the uptake of vaccine is very worrying. You know, there are, I think, about 30% of the older population, that's 60 years uh, plus, who haven't been vaccinated at all. And uh, they're a vulnerable group. Um, and if you look at the population as a whole, less than, four, less than half the population have been vaccinated. Now, what that means is that the virus is still circulating in the population. Uh, granted, we do have a high level of population immunity, but some of that is not due to vaccines. Some of that is due to natural, what you call natural exposure. We don't know how long that immunity is going to last. There is some evidence of waning of the immunity after three months, four months, five months. That's the one problem. And the other problem is that these variants um, are, are, are moving, they're moving antigenically. They're moving, in other words, they're, they're escaping from the immune response. And because of that, we do need to kind of keep up with the boosting of vaccines. Now, in, in terms of can we get it fast enough, well, if we go on our track record up to now, the answer is unfortunately not. And uh, I think this is, this is where the concern is. Um, we do need to have certainly in the older population some degree of boosting because the immunity does wane. Uh, and people are not necessarily going to be protected, particularly with these new subvariants, the B4 and the B5. Those subvariants, unfortunately, are moving along antigenically and are escaping from the immune response. So uh, it's, this is, you know, I, I think people just need to be aware of this, that we can't at this stage drop our guard. The epidemic is still with us, and we can't look what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Their epidemics are mainly coming down. Ours is going up. And uh, their vaccination coverage, and that gives you a better immunity. We can't be fooled that natural immunity is better than vaccine immunity. Unfortunately, it's not. And we're in a quite a different position. We can't look to what, uh, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in North America. Uh, we're in a different situation, and we still, need to be, we still need to be cautious in this country. Yeah. Dr. Barnes, are there limits to these clinical tools that we're talking about? Because the narrative is that, well, now we've got these clinical tools, we've got vaccination, uh, we, we've, we, we've got uh, the immune or what others call antivirals, and, and, and therefore we, we are good to go. Are, are there limits, Dr. Barnes, to... To, to, to these clinical tools, and therefore, do we need to develop some, some serious new prevention methods? We, we are back to hoping again. We are back, back in the situation where people are hoping that that's going to be. They don't have any proof that it will be. I have a little wish list that I would actually like to share with you. 
I, I think we can greatly up our game when it comes to information campaigns and so on. A lot of the previous ones, especially in the beginning, to almost resembled instructions. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Do this. But there was no explanation with it. Even simple explanations that people can understand. So relatively recently, for a while, um, uh, the um, authorities said that people must use their common sense while we were between um, different sets of rules that were kicking in. But you can only use common sense if you have the information to make that uh, um, choice or decision on, if you understand. And even in simple terms, there's been very little education, very little information on, on how it works. So we have a large population who are vaccine hesitant. One of the things that I had found in various other places is that many of the vaccine hesitants said that they would contemplate going if a person they trust in their own circle um, helps them to make the decision and even accompanies them. That's a Gogo or an Oma or a, 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 a a, a, a person, uh, the, the leader of the sports club or a religious leader or whatever, talks to them and convinces them. I have not yet seen any appeal for people to, to say, can you each one teach one? Can you perhaps just get one more person to go for vaccines? There, there are all these things that one can do that I'm finding is not there. Uh, uh, so, and the last thing that I'm really, really so concerned about, one of the big factors that can help is simply better increasing ventilation, particularly in public buildings. By that I mean shops and yeah. all sorts of office buildings. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anywhere a meeting, planning, building inspectors or anybody even looking at not air conditioning, that's out of our reach, but just ventilation, getting more air flowing through and taking uh, the, the buildup of virus away. So there are definitely things that I feel passionate yeah, about that yeah, we yeah. can do. And I'm, I'm not yet seeing that. Yeah. Prof. Shaub, I mean, just to weigh in on that, is, 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 is that the best that we have to reduce airborne spread? At this particular point, better ventilation. I mean, there's there's all talk now that is uh, beginning to emerge, especially in those countries up north that you're talking about, where they are saying we should be spending more of our money now, coming up with um, a, a much more better ways to reduce airborne spread, uh, uh, independent of the variants that we are talking about. Yeah, I, I think certainly ventilation is is important. Uh, we know that, for example, outdoors. The, uh, uh, the risk of transmission is very, very much less. It's not zero, by the way, but certainly very much less. It obviously, it also depends on physical distance. Basically, the way the virus is spread is that we are generating droplets and also aerosols. Aerosols are kind of fine fluid. And as I'm speaking to you now, I'm generating these aerosols. And these aerosols can remain suspended in the air for a number of hours, in fact. So good ventilation will then disperse these, um, th these aerosols and greatly reduce the risk of transmission. So certainly ventilation and the outdo an outdoor environment is, a great, is, is very important. But also in terms of airborne transmission, what's extremely important are the masks. And, uh, you know, masking, you know, we, we, need to, uh, we need to get used to wearing masks. People from the Orient have been wearing masks for, for, for centuries now. If someone has a cold or flu, they wear a mask. And I think that's something that we need to kind of engender, that sense of hygiene stopping people getting infected from people who are infected. And I, and I think this is, uh, you know, COVID might teach us this, but I think this is one of the very important things which I think we're getting lax. And I see it outdoor. I see it walking out into the malls. I see it walking out into various situations, and even in the universities and the right. schools and so on, that people are not on the, are now kind of getting mask apathetic, yeah. and the masks are extremely important. Um, and a mask must be worn correctly. They must cover both the nose and the mouth. You know, there's not much point protecting your chin or your Adam's apple. You know, you've got to protect <laughs> your nose and your mouth. That's where the aerosols get generated, right. and that's where you inhale 
infected uh, aerosols. Let's leave it there for tonight. I appreciate you. Thank you very much for coming on, Professor Barry Shobe and uh, Dr.